Good afternoon. It's Tuesday, the 1st of March 2016, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Brian Gerrish. With me in the studio, Mike Robinson. Good afternoon. Well, it's a bit um, cold, chilly, grey, uh, was raining, brightening slightly in Plymouth. We think that the prize goes to Pembrokeshire, where apparently there's sun, and uh, there has been a, a sudden outpouring of corgis who are all uh, there amongst the daffodils. So if you're in the Pembrokeshire area of Wales, you're clearly doing uh, very well today. Uh, Manchester is just described as damp. So pretty gloomy stuff in Manchester, which is ideal for the referendum, Mike, I suppose. Uh, but uh, we're starting with warm, wa warm weather. Of course, global warming climate change. Allegedly. Um, so apparently winter, this winter was the warmest ever in England and Wales. It has been pretty warm and wet in Plymouth anyway, in general, a bit colder in the last few weeks. Uh, but uh, this is the Met Office who are crowing about uh, temperatures being beating all previous records, uh, including those set in 2007 and 1989. Uh, and uh, I didn't really want to say any more about this um, other than this article. There's no mention of the words El Nino, which of course is what's driving this warm airstream that we're getting at the moment. Um, and uh, is El Nino anything to do with global warming? I don't think it is. I wouldn't have thought so, but... Um who knows what they're up to at the moment. Uh, but there we are. The uh, weather is uh, changeable. A uh, bit like the political situation at the moment. Very confused. And many people are saying to us what is going on because there's so much appearing in the public domain. Well, one thing people haven't missed is Theresa May. And as the Mail article here says, Theresa May accused of exploiting the EU campaign to sneak the snoopers charter into law while MPs are distracted. These MPs, Mike, are just so naive that um, one little bit of publicity in one area, they will forget what they're looking at and, and in comes um, Reaper and uh, we've got a spying, a state spying on us like, um, well, never, never before seen. Well, the key thing about the Snoopers Charter is that it's an, an attempt to retrospectively legalize stuff that's been going on for quite a number of years. Um, there's not really much else to say about that, is there? Except it's obvious, but not to MPs. A little bit later in the news, we'll probably discover why it's so difficult for MPs to understand these uh, sorts of things. And we'll just be taking a little peek at uh, local Conservative MP, uh, Mr Colville. Um, but let's just talk a little bit more about the Snoopers Charter, because uh, I chose that image. It seemed to be suitable. Uh, so... Uh, She's trying to sneak this through, as you say, but they are announcing the revised pl pl uh, plans today, the revised powers for UK police and security services. Uh, and these, of course, are the response to, um, to what is all the criticism that, the, that they've had. So let's have a look at that. Uh, there's going to be uh, six codes of practice on the use of uh, the Snoopers Charter. Um, there are going to be allegedly stronger privacy safeguards. It hasn't really been identified what those are yet. We haven't seen the final document yet. Uh, apparently, there's going to be a double lock uh, on ministerial warrants, and uh, this double lock is going to come in the form of a judicial commissioner. So whenever uh, a minister wants to issue a warrant, uh, probably one typical uh, use for this might be uh, um, to, uh, to, to ask for foreign intelligence organisations to undertake surveillance activity on GCHQ's behalf, for example. Um, so that is where the double lock would come in. It would require approval by the Secretary of State and a judicial commissioner. Um, they're describing it as a pragmatic approach to encryption, and they're saying that uh, um, this pragmatic approach is going to keep Apple happy. Um, well, I'm not sure how you have a pragmatic approach to a backdoor. Either there's a backdoor in your encryption or there isn't, um, and I don't see how any, any sort of watering down is going to keep Apple happy. Uh, and... Uh, there's going to be shorter time allowance for urgent warrants. So this is the length of time that they're allowed to snoop uh, on you in the case of an urgent warrant. Uh, and uh, they are going to reduce that time, I think, from uh, five days to three days. Um, so that's all right then. Um, the Home Office, as I say, has said that this new legislation, this new proposal, will address concerns expressed by up Apple and other tech giants. So what do you make of that? Uh, well, I think it's more of the same language, Mike. They are bringing in a police state and these reassurances that a minister or a minister is going to approve it and, and we've got some 
judicial commissioner, well, this system doesn't work, does it? And we see time and time again that uh, when they do as they please and somebody complains, you are then locked into the never-ending circle of a complaints uh, procedure. Yeah. So I believe it's a scam and a lie while they bring in more of a police state. Um, and of course, part and parcel of that uh, police state was their independent review on freedom of information. And unfortunately for them, they don't seem to have um, managed to get this through because there was such a backlash from the public that they seem to have chickened out of it. Is that a fair statement? Um, there will be no legal changes, apparently, to the freedom of information legislation after reviewing the act. Um, here's the man himself, Matt Hancock. He uh, organised this review. Uh, he said that... Uh, uh, he was pledging to encourage transparency in the public sector. He said that after 10 years, we took the decision to review the Freedom of Information Act and we found it is working well, apparently. So that's all very good. That's because they're not answering in most of the cases. They don't bother to answer in, in, as, as required with freedom of information. Indeed. So uh, Hancock said, this government is committed to making government more transparent so taxpayers can hold the state to account both on how their money is being spent and how decisions are made uh, which affect their lives. Um, so let's see, what have they said here? Uh, so they, they haven't answered all the uh, Commission's recommendations, but some of them they have. So with regard to charging for freedom of information requests, which is one thing they were uh, going to attempt to do, uh, they have said the government agrees. This is all coming out of the Cabinet Office, by the way. The government agrees with the Commission's view that it is not appropriate to introduce fees for requests over and above the existing narrow circumstances in which a requester can be currently charged for disburse disbursement costs. Uh, and then uh, one thing that a lot of people perhaps don't realise is that there is a Cabinet veto uh, on the issuance of uh, answers. And uh, in this case, they say the Cabinet recommends the introduction of a narrower and more limited veto provision uh, the government agrees with the Commission's analysis that Parliament in, uh, intended the Executive to be able to have the final say as to whether information should be released under the Act. In line with the Commission's thinking, the government will, be, will in future only deploy the veto after an Information Commissioner decision on, this, on that basis, uh, sorry, uh, on the basis that this approach proves effective, we will not bring forward legislation at this stage. It could be legislated for later. And then uh, the other one that, in particular that I wanted to highlight was uh, handling vexatious requests. Uh, the Commission recognises the difficulty that genuinely vexatious requests can place on public authorities. Uh, I'd like to understand their definition of a genuinely vexatious request because in some cases it's simply uh, people are uh, labelled vexatious because they're not getting the relevant answer uh, from the, from the uh, public body. Uh, and he goes on to say, we agree with the recommendations of improved guidance via a revised code of practice to allow public authorities to use the section 14.1 uh, in the rare cases where it's necessary and appropriate. The exercise by citizens of legal rights also brings with it responsibilities and access to f information rights should not be abused to cause distress or means of harassment. Um, so there you go. That's what they're talking about. And of course, as more things get uh, privatised, Mike, uh, they can sidestep the uh, freedom, of in freedom of information request system anyway. Although, where there's a contract so that uh, public sector services have gone straight to a private supplier, um, freedom, of inf freedom of information rules should still apply to that private contractor. In principle, they're simply ignoring the request. Well, right, so, so every time... Uh a private corporation ends up with a freedom of information request, they refuse to answer it, and then unless that's really pressed through the information commissioner, you're not likely to get a response. At all. Uh, which is transparency, which started, of course, under Francis Maud, who just happened to be the man in post uh, when Common Purpose was doing its dirty little backroom training deals yeah. through the Cabinet Office. Uh, well, let's move on to... Oh, I beg your pardon. Okay. Let's move on to the uh, referendum. And um, we received this very interesting email, which I'd like to read out because it's so good. Dear Sir, as a teenager, I worked on the Keep Britain in Europe campaign for Ted Heath. I was conned and I lied to the British people on behalf of a bunch of corrupt people. I'm now 59 and a committed out of the EU supporter. I've researched the net and read and watched reports of the goings on within the EU Commission 
and on its behalf in the UK. Having watched a lot of your clips on the internet, things happening around me make a lot more sense. I've worked in China for 12 years, hence I can see a huge change in the UK's morality in all areas of society on my return. A common purpose still alive and doing their dirty deeds for Europe. Why do the out campaign not expose what is happening and use it to engage the British people to end this silent war with a referendum? I'm a Geordie. We voted no to a local mayor and all that goes with it. It is still going ahead against the wishes of the local people. It's similar to the Cunningham era in the northwest where whole areas were demolished and rebuilt by corruption, putting millions into the pockets of the corrupt. Cunningham ended up in jail, thank God. This time, however, there seems to be no law to stop anything. His son is back on the bandwagon. Very best regards, David. Well, that really says it all, that somebody was conned in the Ted Heath era with going into the uh, European economic community. We were told it was trade. In fact, it's a super state. Uh, but the other questions there, why have we got this breakdown in UK? That is because, as Eric Pickles, uh, Tory minister, says, he's involved in revolution. And before you can build the new EU super state, you have to destroy the old society. So the, the answer to uh, that email is this Tory party is um, hell bent on, on uh, destroying UK from the inside. Led by Mr Cameron, of course, who's uh, prepared to say anything to anyone to get his way. Well, indeed, I wasn't going to say too much about the EU referendum today, but I did, I did want to highlight this article in The Telegraph. Um, the Prime Minister is entitled to back EU membership. They say this is a, a, an opinion piece. Uh, but his tactics are cause for uh, growing concern. And they say at the referendum due in June, uh, the official policy of David Cameron's government is that Britain should adopt to remain a member of the European Union. There is no dishonour in that position, which is openly stated. The electorate will, in due course, be able to pass judgment on the government for it. However, the way in which the government is acting in pursuit of that policy is a cause for growing concern. And they go on to discuss the whole fear aspect of this. Uh, and they end up by saying the Prime Minister should think again about preventing ministers who seek to leave the EU seeing government papers on this issue. Not only does this, the, that stricture impede the ordinary business of governing, it further adds to the impression of a Prime Minister fearful of losing ground in the referendum battle and willing to take even desperate measures to win. So they highlight some interesting points, but of course they don't quite get to grips with why uh, this referendum is... Uh, totally chaotic and uh, perhaps if anybody didn't see our program yesterday uh, you might uh, have a look at it and uh, that perhaps will give you a clue. Um, but uh, in the meantime of course uh, the the markets in inverted commas um, continue to punish uh, the UK uh, and what we've got here is an article highlighting that uh, the UK gilts, this is UK debt being sold on the markets, um, is uh, are pretty unpopular at the moment. Nobody is wanting to buy them. Um, now, what, one of the interesting statistics out of this uh, little article here uh, is the fact that the government is required to raise £10 billion pounds a month in order to, uh, from international markets in order to fund uh, the so-called budget deficit and keep uh, the government running. Uh, £10 billion pounds a month, and uh, they're not really selling any gilts at the moment, so it's looking like there may uh, possibly be what the FT is describing as a rare failed auction. Um, so Does that this was, mean we're bankrupt, Mike? No, it just means that uh, it just means that the markets uh, are uh, hinting that perhaps we should stay in, um, well, because uh, unless we do, they're not going to give us any money, and if we don't get any money, then the government can't uh, function. So um, it's it's a question of servicing debt, isn't it? Uh, and uh, well, they shouldn't be taking this approach in the first place, in, in my opinion. But uh, others may have different views. Uh, well, let's take the subject of money and bring it down to a local level. And what better place to start than Plymouth? Here's the headline from the uh, Plymouth Herald. Council tax bills will rise this year in Plymouth as councillors approve budget in heated meeting. I encourage people to go to the Herald site and read this um, really excellent report. Uh, this is just a bit of it. It says the rise will bring in 1.8 million for the council, 33% of the required cut to adult social care with the money ring fence to keep vulnerable elderly people in their own homes or provide supported housing for adults 
with complex needs. So there you've got it. There's the, there's the pull on the heartstrings. We're going to tax you more in order to help these elderly people um, and, um, and help the care system. But the reality is these people are absolutely at each other's throats as a result of the international banking cartel's lie that there is no money. Uh, Mike, you're really touching, you've really just touched on part of that. But it's ironic that uh, we're hearing some very interesting accusations that Plymouth Social Services are actually attempting to take away the property from elderly people. They, so They wouldn't do that, would they? Well, I have to say, it appears that they are doing exactly that, so that uh, when people um, are ill or they require some form of care, the first thing that happens is a charge is placed on their house, and then it would appear that social services manoeuvre in position to uh, take their homes. Uh, if that's being reported in Plymouth, it's also being reported from other locations across UK. So we think on the back of the lie, there is no money, there's a particularly unpleasant social agenda at work. But let's hop across to uh, Vote Leave. Uh, here's the website. We don't trust this website at all on the basis that it's a false, um, it's a false site, in our opinion, uh, leading people towards a vote out, but they don't really mean that at all. However, we did take it, uh, we did take up on their figure on the screen, which is a mere 506 billion pounds. Uh, this is apparently the amount that we've paid into the EU to date. And if you watch the website, uh, you see this, which is it clocking up literally every second. So in Plymouth, we have councillors at each other's throats that there is no money to care for the elderly, vulnerable and sick. But the reality, of course, is that both Labour, Lib Dem and uh, the Tories are pumping our money into what is a fraudulent and corrupt uh, European Union. Um, any better in Moscow, Mike? Well, I was fascinated by this story. Uh, this is the Moscow, uh, the Russia Health Service in Omsk. And uh, what are they saying here? A 69-year-old woman has died in a hospital in the Siberian city of Omsk after she was forced to spend three hours in the queue waiting to be seen by a doctor. And my first reaction to this was that British people would die for a health service that they only have to wait three hours in the queue to attend. Um, and so this is Omsk in Siberia, sort of the, the, the outer reaches of the Russian Empire. And, <laughs> and they're worried about standing for th or waiting for three hours in a queue. I'd also so, say from that picture, it all looks pretty clean and tidy inside. So um, there's now going to be a, an investigation by the prosecutor's general office uh, so they're uh, carrying out an investigation into the incident. So, you know, we should be ashamed of the state of our NHS at the moment, which, of course, is, is not the fault of the doctors and the nurses and is purely the fault of policy and management and the common purpose. Um, but I also wanted to highlight this um, because it was in the mail, but it was in a number of other places. It was on the BBC uh, Today programme this morning. Towns that make you live longer, NHS plans estates with anti-trip pavements and fewer takeaways. And what have we got here? Instead of the National Health Service concentrating on treating people, uh, people's health, um, they're, gonna, they're getting into property development. And so what they're going to build is uh, 10 new housing estates. Uh, the, the one that is uh, highlighted in the mail article here says that it will eventually uh, look after 170,000 people. Uh, and they're going to, it's basically a lab experiment. Uh, what they're doing here is they're going to offer, they're going to trial a range of different measures. So this is an experiment. Um, they're going to look at people's behavior based on, for example, how far away takeaway, you know, uh, fast food takeaway outlets are to schools, uh, how much uh, land is set aside for, for outdoor activities and this sort of thing encouraging people to walk rather than drive. Drive. This is a massive behavioural experiment, massive on a scale we haven't seen before, and this is the NHS and of uh, course it's organising an it. Sorry, Mike. No, go ahead. Of course, it's an NHS, which is a gnat's whisker from being fully privatised. So this won't be the public sector NHS running this lot. It's effectively going to be private corporations. That's right. So, so this is being pushed forward. Uh, by the uh, Chief Executive of uh, NHS England and Wales. Uh, and uh, what did he have to say? Uh, 
it's going to be sorry it's he he describe he will describe apparently later on today uh, the house this housing experiment as a golden opportunity for the NHS to help promote health and keep people independent he said uh, he will say we want children to have places where they want to play with friends and can safely walk and cycle to school rather than just exercising their fingers on video games well at first glance that might seem like a laudable thing uh, but um, this isn't particularly the way to do it. Oh, we just remember that video game uh, comment, Mike, uh, because I have something which links in very nicely. So the NHS is going to build our cities, maintain the pavements, and make sure the children don't get involved with video games. Yes. Apparently. Okay. Okay, uh, tonight, reminder, uh, in Froome, uh, the Saving Syrian Children, Serious Children documentary, the critique of that by Robert Stewart, who has done so much fantastic research into how this, uh, this documentary was put together, the timing of it and so on. Uh, it's uh, in the Wheat Sheaves, Bath Street, from begins at 7.30, three pounds entrance. Please get along to it if you can. It'll, it's going to be hugely interesting. Uh, Brian and I will be there and Theo as well. Indeed. Uh, well, that brings us uh, very nicely to our illustrious King, King David, Prime Minister of Great Britain, and uh, here he is. Um, what has he been up to? Well, this is a really telling article in The Telegraph, Secret Plans to Axe 90% of Tory Associations, which would help smooth the way for George Osborne's coronation as leader. Well, the George Osborne bid is a bit of a smokescreen in itself because... Uh, what is going to happen is a massive cutback, a massive attack on the associations, which is really the heart of the Tory party and public, the public getting involved with the party. So under the new plans, Tory associations will be merged um, into between 60 and 70 multi-constituency associations based loosely on county areas. I'm going to predict now, of course, it won't be county areas, it will be regions. And um, the super associations will employ permanent party staff. So the local association chairmen who know people on the ground, know their communities, they're going to go and they're going to be replaced by centralised party staff. Um, this is the Stalinist state coming in, Mike. Um, so the party's membership list will be run centrally from Conservative Central Office, further cutting out the traditional role of the chairman and allowing the leadership to communicate directly with members. Is, I, that, is that the big society where the, I, where the, the king in the centre communicates with everybody right down to the uh, whole face? Indeed. I would say communicate really means control, yeah. but uh, they've used the word communicate. We just thought we'd remind people a little bit about David Cameron. Uh, this was David Cameron who basically told his MPs to ignore the views of Eurosceptic grassroots members. You don't want to pay attention to the associations because they've got their finger on the button. They know the European Union is rotten. So what does Cameron say? Ignore them. How can he say that? Because he knew that uh, the next step was to get rid of the Conservative associations. And we better remind people, of course, that David Cameron has pledged has said that his loyalty isn't to this country anyway. His loyalty to Israel is unshakable. So by the time this system's come in place, it presumably will be Israel that will be running the Tory party. I may be a bit cynical there, uh, but uh, we'll also remind you that if you dare to criticize, uh, maybe it's gonna get a bit dangerous because of course we showed a few uh, days ago that uh, the chairman of uh, Cameron's Whitney constituency who wrote a very revealing report exposing the rot in the Tory party was found dead uh, a mere 20 hours later. So um, that's what's coming and uh, there's no secret about it. The Telegraph is bringing it into the public domain very nicely. Uh, this was a fascinating email from a gentleman who says that the situation uh, mirrors what was happening with the um, Esperanto Association of Britain when they cut off the regional federations and distanced the local clubs. And in the heart of this email is they were able to do this because they had money coming in from different directions. They didn't need people on the ground, so they didn't really care what was going to happen. And uh, so the local membership was cut out 
and uh, the email here ends, the Cam uh, Cameronites, I think, are in the same position. They don't need members any longer, and they must be scared stiff of a repeat of the Corbyn factor. Dictatorship in the ruling party means dictatorship in the country. This, this couldn't be more obvious, Mike, could it? Indeed. Right, how is the EU destroying this country? Well, let's come to the heart of the Southwest. I think we've covered this organization before, but this is one of the massive networks which simply is there in order to feed off European money. Um, go and have a look at the site it, yourself. It says, as the country debates European membership, we continue to strive for the best possible deals for our area. Currently, we're gearing up for our anticipated role to provide technical assistance to new applicants for European funding. So this whole thing is a begging bowl from the European Union. And as you will see in a minute, it links together a whole raft of people uh, in the Southwest. But we mentioned video games. This is part of their site where they're boasting about funding streams for the creative digital and design community. And have a look at this because Creative Europe is the European Union's program to support the cultural, creative and audiovisual sectors. And from 2014 to 2020, they've got a mere 1.46 billion uh, to support projects, which as you read at the bottom includes film, television, new media and games. So I wonder whether the NHS should be getting in there and closing down. Um, uh, heart of the uh, Southwest on the basis that heart of the Southwest appears to be bad for your mind. Mm. 1.46 billion, but there's no money to care for needy people. Have a look at this organization yourself. It's very glossy, but everything is to do with feeding off European money, much of which has come from us in the first place. And of course, it's about devolution and regionalization. So this is government, uh, this is EU centralized policy. And um, the best way for me to show you people involved, bear with me, it's a little bit slow, uh, but um, this is a pernicious mix of corporatists, accountants, local authority people who are all in a giant club in order to beg from the European Union. And of course, once they're taking the European Union euro, uh, they are completely owned. So as the public tries to decide on coming out of Europe, um, these people will be in the background. And here's our very own Tudor Evans, um, Labour leader from Plymouth City Council. Uh, so he's happy to give money to the European Union while he sits in the debating chamber saying they can't look after people in care. Have a look yourselves. It's an extraordinary mix of people. I think we'll leave it there, feeding off EU money. And while that's going on, of course, British Armed Forces are being cut to the bone. Uh, there's been several reports on this. Part of it has achieved um, an early reach of the targets for redundancy. So the armed forces being decimated. Uh, some reasonable statistics for the BBC here showing the army down to just over 80,000, which is not viable in any significant conflict. We now know why this is being done, because through the back door, David Cameron has accepted European policy for what is known as acceptable merger rates uh, within the cross the pan European um, Union military. So what they're doing is cutting back the ones that are too strong, such as British military forces, so that they can be fully integrated uh, with the European military. And these are the elements coming very quickly. The EU Treasury, which you've mentioned, Mike, EU military and EU super state. None of our MPs can uh, understand this, of course. Here's the reason why. Meet Oliver Colville. Uh, this man, for months, believes that the most important issue in this country is the uh, plight of hedgehogs. I, I suspect, I suspect uh, we're about to find out why, because maybe he was channeling some money to the hedgehogs or something, I don't know. Uh, but um, he has been named among as one of 24 Tory MPs who didn't declare 
thousands of pounds worth of uh, election expenses. And in his case, it was with regard to his campaigning on his battle bus. Uh, 2,000 pounds a day is what he was uh, paying uh, for renting the bus, uh, paying expenses for volunteers. It's quite an interesting little statistic in this article as well, because apparently one particular Tory activist in, was invoicing the Tory party 1,060 pounds a day for a time uh, campaigning with uh, Oliver Colville, that, and that was over 10 days. Well, he probably needed somebody with that expertise, Mike, because, of course, his vocabulary a little bit limited hedgehogs and not so good on state of the nation. Uh, indeed. So uh, the Mirror, according to the Herald here, uh, says that Mr Colville didn't declare money spent on the bus, hotels or food. I mean, that's got to be uh, simple corruption, no? Particularly in an election time when every penny is supposed to be accounted for uh, in order to guarantee fairness between the candidates. Well, I don't think politicians call it that, Mike. I think uh, normally it's, it's um, an accounting error it's an oversight or it's somebody else's fault. Right. There we go. Um, Syria, probably. Um, yes, Syria. Well, the ceasefire is still in place despite all the uh, allegations that, that it isn't. Um, but uh, Sunday night saw a telephone call between Lavrov and John Kerry uh, discussing the ceasefire and they were mainly discussing how they might work together because, of course, uh, Syria, uh, the Syrian government and the Russians have said that they want to keep the pressure on ISIS and on the Al Nusra front. Um, so they discussed uh, coordinating approaches um, to the UN Security Council resolution, which was, uh, this is a separate thing aimed at North Korea as well. So they had a good conversation apparently. Uh, but with regard to Syria, um, it's pretty clear that the ceasefire is mainly holding at the moment. Um, this seems to be the pressures that are operating within ISIS seem to be boiling over. So uh, one headline that I saw uh, was pointing out that eight Netherlanders uh, who were uh, working with ISIS recently uh, were beheaded um, in the last couple of days because they were trying to escape. So I guess um, they were trying to take advantage of the ceasefire to get out. They got caught. They got their heads cut off. Um, so that's eight out of apparently 200 people from the Netherlands uh, fighting uh, in Syria and Iraq. Um, it didn't stop, however, according to Global Research, and no reason to, I mean, this is a, another good article from them, uh, it didn't stop the, uh, some of the UN humanitarian aid, which has been going in during this ceasefire time, uh, accidentally landing in ISIS-controlled territory in uh, Deir Zor. So, Deir Zor, sorry. so uh, they're saying here the UN World Food Programme aid for the restricted uh, Syrian civilians in Deir Zor have landed nearly, um, sorry, have landed mostly in ISIS-controlled territories, a source in the city's administration said on Thursday. Uh, planes dropped the humanitarian help by the United, uh, sent by the United Nations into territory controlled by Daesh. Just two containers ended up in the areas where the Syrian army is located. Uh, and uh, that was according to RIA Novosti. So uh, they're doing a good job there. Well, I can't really understand it, Mike, because, of course, we're being told at the moment that technology, precision weapons, pre precision navigation systems means that uh, we can pick out indi individual terrorists in Syria to be taken out by uh, drone strikes. But apparently we can't drop supplies in roughly the right area. Apparently. Apparently. Well, we better end on uh, this uh, gentleman. Here he is, Tony Blair. Um, a book uh, has come out um, called Broken Vows, which is uh, really beginning to put the spotlight back on Tony Blair. And in particular, the book is saying this man simply did not tell the truth uh, to people around him, senior Whitehall officials, and in particular, senior military staff. Well, not much of a surprise there. But the other thing in this article, which is of great interest, is it suggests that uh, the Chilcot inquiry is... Um, report will be released uh, very shortly. So that would be good timing to keep uh, people's attention off the EU referendum, Mike. Amazing timing. Amazing. What a coincidence. Well, there we are. Could we put it in any plainer words? Uh, UK at the moment is being taken apart. How is it being taken apart? It's being taken apart because all of the public institutions which should be there running the country and protecting us have been corrupted infiltrated, corrupted, and simply dismantled. 
Who is doing it? Well, there's only one answer to that. The political party in power, the Conservatives, led by David Cameron, the man who's pledged his allegiance not to Britain, but to a foreign country, including the EU super state. If we want to stop it, we need to explain what's happening to people. We need to expose the truth and we need to challenge MPs who clearly uh, are beginning, I think, to drop out of the real world. And saying that, of course, I have Mr Oliver Colville in mind. That's it for us today. We'll be back same time tomorrow and we'll be joined by Alex, Alex, Thompson. Alex Thompson from the Netherlands. OK, see you then. Bye bye. bye. bye.